So tonight is just 10 days away, about 10 days away of the most exciting and awesome day of the year. The day that we celebrate the inauguration of the King of the Universe on the day that is set to be the birthday of the world. So we as amazing human beings are still limited. As amazing as we are, we're still limited. So we have limited understanding at every given time. We have varied reactions to situations. And we all have a different level of emotional capacity. Our intellectual, emotional, educational, cognitive, and every capacity we have can expand when we learn or experience different things in life. Our limited capacity makes us err and learn and expand and then try again. And that's how we grow. Parents' capacity are also human. And parents' capacity to love and appreciate and understand their child at all times, no matter what, are sometimes also limited, unfortunately. Some, for, to some parents, it's sometimes limited. But God's capacity is unlimited. Hashem's love is totally transcendent, and so is His tolerance. Hashem's love is not contingent on anything. And guess what? Hashem can hold us and support us and listen to us no matter what we do or don't do. No matter how hurt we are, no matter how angry we are, no matter our actions, doesn't matter. Hashem has the capacity to hold us and to love us beyond any reason. Hashem is like a loving parent that is never stuck or limited. So when I when, say that a healthy, loving parent wants to teach their two-year-old child, um, let's say the oven is on and they want to teach their two-year-old child not to touch the, the hot parts of the oven, but the two-year-old child doesn't really listen and runs over and does touch it and, and they burn their fingers. Um, and sometimes maybe they end up in the hospital. The parent would be hurting for their two-year-old child. I mean, a healthy parent would not be angry at the child. The parent would be upset what happened to the child. They would, be, they would be hurting for the child. In the same way, Hashem might somewhat sometimes be upset, you know, about what we do for ourselves when we mess up. Because when we mess up, we end up thinking sometimes that we are now more distant in this relationship. And he's hurting about our feeling distant. Hashem does not want us to really ever feel distant. Um, I'll give a, a little parable. So say there are two, fr two people that are really, really um, devoted friends, really devoted friends, and really care for each other's, feel for each other's. Um, so friend number one is in a better financial state right now. Friend number two is having financial difficulties to the point that it feels like his business is going to collapse. Um, so he turns to friend number one, to his friend, and he says, can you maybe give me a loan? Uh, whatever it is, whatever amount it is, of whatever, how many thousands it is. And friend number one says, yeah, I'll give you a loan. I would want you to return it at a certain date. Well, maybe that restriction could hurt for friend number two, although they're very devoted friends, um, but he'll, he'll take the loan. So he, he takes the loan, invests it in his business, and sadly, that loan, that investment gets lost as well, and the business collapses. Friend number two is in so much pain, and in so much fear, and in so much hurt, that instead of turning back to friend number one, he says, I'm never going to face my friend again, never. I'm, he, asked back for the, he asked for the money back at a certain time, and here I literally... I literally drained the money and he just goes into so much anger and pain, takes the last uh, few dollar bills, rolls it up with tobacco or whatever and smokes it up. And that's the end of the money. And never wants to turn back to friend number one again. Friend number one sees and understands what happened, that his friend does not want to turn back to him anymore. And instead of being angry, he is a really devoted friend. Yes, he wanted his money back, for whatever reason he needed it, and he had all the rights to give a set date, but he really loves his friend, and he is not really interested that his friend should part from him 
or cut the relationship. So he calls him, follows up, up with him and tries. And friend number two would not even pick up a phone and not even turn back to him because he is so hurt and he's feeling so inferior and so afraid to just speak it out that he's just going to drift away further and further. Now, now let's imagine it as a, a, a road with two lanes. So friend number two is in the right lane, friend number one is in the left lane, all going one way. They're always walking together in their lives, being there for each other. And friend number two in this, in this story gets so, so hurt about what happened and he is so confused and he is so afraid and he is so inferior about this that he just walks off the road to the right side, off the shoulder and starts walking right as far as possible. So friend number one, that's really caring and loving and hurts for his friend. He's not angry about his friend. He's hurting for his friend. He's not gonna just walk on down the road and let his friend go. And he's not even going to stay in the middle of the road and let his friend part far away. But he's going to walk in the back behind. He's gonna follow his friend through the forest until his friend is going to decide to turn back and what's gonna happen when friend number two turns back and says, I need to face my friend again, I miss him. He's just gonna be right there. And friend number one is just gonna be there to embrace him. That's exactly how Hashem runs his world with us, with his children. He's always there for us and always follows us. No matter how much pain we're having, no matter if we messed up, no matter if the pain and whatever in life was imposed on us for whatever reason that we don't always understand, Hashem is never going to leave us. He's always going to follow us because he does not want to cut that relationship. So even when we think that our relationship with Hashem is gone and dead, he doesn't give up. He follows. And he, he has a very long anger span. We call Hashem Erech Hapayim. It doesn't really mean slow to anger. It means he has a very long anger span, meaning he knows our pain and he sees what we go through in life and he knows our pain from all the way back. But he also sees our potential to the end of our life. And he has this much time to ever get angry. And really he doesn't angry, he feels bad for the person. So to Hashem, anger doesn't happen like it happens to us. And the way we see situations is totally, totally not the way Hashem sees, us, sees it. He's calm about us, he loves us, he feels bad for us, he waits for us, he follows us, and he has the ability and capacity to take a lot more than, any, than a human being can so that we cannot even fathom it. And he's there at every given moment. He's the only and least judgmental being in this world. So why is it that we're so afraid of, of, of Rosh Hashanah? and of Yom Kippur. And why is it that there is a tefillah in, that we say called in Sanatokov, that most of us know about, where it says that this is the day, you know, where, where it gets inscribed of who's gonna live, who's gonna die, who's gonna be rich, who's gonna be poor. And then, Rosh Hashanah, and then we say Rosh Hashanah, it's inscribed, Yom Kippur, it's, it's like stamped. And people go crying. I mean, it's like, it, it's overwhelming. There is a, a quite a bit of a misinterpretation of, of, I can't say of the tefillah, but of the way of seeing this. This is the day, this is the day that we are inaugurating Hashem again. It's the first day, it's the day that Rosh Hashanah is said to be the day that Hashem created the world. And every year he's being re-anointed. Re and it's a very happy day. It really is a very happy day. It is also a day when the king looks at his, at his, uh, uh, at his country, at his people, and he says, who is really the one that is interested in me being king and wants to be my servant and wants to be, you know, the people that I should serve them and be there for them. And when we show interest in this day, an excitement in this day, and acceptance of Hashem as our God, then we're in. Yes, it is the day that it is being inscribed. Who is it that is interested in, in having me be there for them and with them? It is the day that's being inscribed. And it is the day like a, 
like a yearly reassessment of the world. But guess who's reassessing us? Our dear loving father that his love is way, way, way more than human capacity can ever love. And even though things were hard last year, it's a new year, it's a new start, it's a new opening, it's new hope. And if there's love between us and God, then the hope is even more beautiful and even brighter. Yes, it is the day of inscribing, and it is an awesome day. But inscribing doesn't mean negativity. It doesn't mean any, it doesn't have to come with a connotation of projecting negativity and fear. We all do ask for everything good to happen this coming year, and we do hope. But mainly Rosh Hashanah is about really embracing that relationship over again. Now, one of the most beautiful things that we say in Yom Kippur is, um, as I mentioned before, that Hashem follows us and he has a very long anger span and he is not there to judge us negatively because he is not judgmental. This assessment is not about being judgmental. And we are all in Hashem's space, just like an unborn is in, the, in, in a mother's womb and the mother feels its movement all the time. Hashem really feels us. He knows our pain. He knows our hardships. This is not really the place where I'm going to explain right now, except if someone asks that, wants to ask a question in the end, I can try to explain a little bit the concept of pain, which is not exactly, you can't answer everything, um, but it could be explained a little bit. So I can't really now, you know, um, expound on why all the pain, but yes, many of us have been having a painful year and painful years and hardships, but Hashem really feels it. He knows it like a mother feels her child. We are in his space. And he feels bad for us, but never about us. Um, one of the most beautiful things we say on Yom Kippur is, is, um, is the verse, kilo, kilo ech So it's an interesting verse because it says that, ha, that Hashem does not desire the dying of the dead. And that's very weird. What exactly does that mean? And then it says, um, because if they will turn back, I will imbue life into them. And until the day of their death, I stand there and wait for them. If they will turn, then I will, I will embrace them. So what exactly does that mean? Sometimes we feel so guilty and so inferior to whatever it is that we do, that, that we, you know, we all make mistakes, we all mess up at times, and we all mess up many times, and we can sometimes just mess up daily and sometimes a few times a day. And sometimes, we feel so guilty and, 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 and we blame ourselves so much that we end up thinking that we're drifting away from this relationship with God and really drifting away. And sometimes some of us feel like, you know, we've gone too far and this relationship is dead and there is really no spiritual spark in me. And, and I, just, I just see myself as dead in this relationship. That part of us that we feel that died inside of us that vision, that, that, that self-judgment of feeling dead, that's what the, the verse calls as dead in the beginning. And that's why it says, because I don't desire the dying of the dead. Because if they will only give like one, it says, because if they will turn from their ways, they will decide to recalculate, then I'll be, imbue life into them. I'll make them feel alive. I'll make this relationship feel alive. And until their actual day of physical dying, uh, the, the minute they will turn, it says, Shiva, the minute they will turn, I will, I will embrace them. It's exactly like, like this parable that I just said of the two friends that one took a loan and then went so far away, but his friend was following him the whole time. And the second he turned, his friend was there to embrace them. That's exactly what this verse means. So, um, so by the way, um, when what I just said before that Hashem's love is unconditional and that and that there's there's nothing in the world that really turns him down to a point where he's gonna stop loving us or or uh, bring his love to be contingent, we were able to see that very clearly at the destruction of the temple. At the time of the destruction of the temple, there was a lot of hatred and and. Well, most, most of the Jews were very, 
were being disconnected and there was no friendship and there was a lot of it was very problematic and and it ended up bringing the destruction of the temple and in the holy of holies the kodesh Hakadoshim, in the holy there was the crew and the two bird figures on the top of the of the aron and um when the when the i think it was yeah i think it was the babylonians the babylonians when they went into the holy of holies um or the last sight of the of the cherubs of the kruvim of the two like bird figures was the two of them hugging each other's um literally the wings were spread over one another and they were bent forward like they were hugging each other's one bird always represented god and one bird represented the jewish nation and this was the way before the Aaron was taken away this was the way hashem bid us farewell and that was in a time where most of the jewish nation were so shattered so broken so pained so disconnected and had Hashem bid, bid us farewell with a hug. So, so it doesn't really, I mean, whatever it is that we do doesn't really, so the Hashem's love is really not contingent of anything. It's not what we do that makes him love us or not. He loves us just because he loves us and he loves us unconditionally. Whatever we do is what we do for ourselves, for our connection to him. So why is Rosh Hashanah an exciting day? Um, so how do, how do we think of a prince that, uh, you know, how, how would a prince feel in a day that he knows that his father is being anointed as a king? Probably excited, probably awed by the occasion, and maybe even emotional. And, and I probably, I think, all of the above. So this is really the day of Rosh Hashanah, when the king that is being anointed is our father. But what happens when, let's say that the prince was sent away when he was a very young child, or he was lost from his father, really young. Um, he doesn't really know his father. He has no idea who his father is, and he doesn't really remember the language of his father. Um, his father probably wouldn't even know um, how he calls himself by, if the child remembers his name, the way he gave it to him. And it's the day that the father is going to meet the child. And in that day that the father is going to meet his son, he's going to want to call him. Uh, whichever name he's going to use will probably get no response. He doesn't know if the child knows himself by the name that the father gave him. And the father is thinking, how is it that I can connect to my child? And he remembers the lullaby that he used to sing for him as a baby. And he starts to sing the lullaby. And the child comes over and falls into his father's embrace. So the first day of Rosh Hashanah is called Zichron Tiria, in remembrance of blowing shofar. That's how it's called, the first day. Um, so why is it a remembrance of blowing shofar? What is the remembering of the blowing shofar? And what memories does it really bring up? The shofar reminds Hashem, our father, and our relationship of when we were young. When the Kohen, when the Holy Priest would go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, there would be shofar blowing. And that was the time that Hashem felt very connected to us. And that is, the time, that is one of the times of, we could call our youth. And, and also when we, when we received the Torah. When we received the Torah was when our relationship was officially forged. We were, we were a very young child to Hashem. And the blowing of the shofar reminds him and us of that young and pure relationship that we had from many years ago. And, and that's actually, that's excitement. That's, that's, that's awe. That's meeting up, meeting up with our father. And the first day is also a day of accepting Hashem as our king and accepting the relationship again. There is absolutely no sadness or no projecting negativity in this day and with the sound of the shofar. Vilna Gaon said that we should blow the shofar with joy, like when we're anointing a king and there's trumpets. Ta -ta 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 -ta, I can't really make it, whatever it is. I can't, I can't imitate the, the trumpets. But that's the way you really anoint a king. There is no sadness in anointing a king. And the first day of Rosh Hashanah is the day of anointing the king and the shofar should be blown with joy, with happiness. 
the second day that we blow shofar is already a day that we're accepting our king as our guidance. I will try to maximize my potential and vigor of life to the best of my ability. And God, as hard as it is sometimes, I'll let you lead. The second day is already letting ourselves be led by the king. The first day is accepting and anointing the king. And the second day is letting ourselves be led. And the long prayers that we pray afterwards by Musaf is, is like a canopy, and I'll explain it. It's like an expansion to all this. As one of my Rebbe's explained that um, his father used to tell him that the Japanese soldiers years ago, when they were found dead, um, they were, they were found with a picture of, an, of the emperor, of the Japanese emperor, wrapped up into many layers of cloth on their bodies. And so when they would go to war, they would protect the picture of their emperor with many layers of cloth. So this is what we're doing when we're praying that long prayer of Musaf after we anoint God as king. We're adding layers to bolster and beautify his kingship and our relationship. Now, what happens when that lost prince meets that father and the prince is so overwhelmed that he can't even talk? He's overwhelmed by what he's gone through in the past and, and he can't even express himself in words. It's just like the ones of us that can't expand on Philos. So we're not ready to dive in. Some have gone through so much in this past year that it's hard for them to stand and pray. They can hardly process what they've gone through. And when they hear the chauffeur and they say, okay, God, I accept and we'll make this relationship alive again. That's enough. That says everything. It's like, it's like a quiet connection that, that is like, it's, it's like a speechless connection just by the song of the chauffeur. And that can be also very, very deep when there's really no words. And what happens when we're very, very angry and very, very sad or hurt by what we've gone through in the past and even hurt at our father? How could you send me away? How could you let me go through all this? Why weren't you there for me? Why, why, did, why didn't you respond when I was in so much pain? Doesn't that matter? So that's a lot of pain that we sometimes carry with ourselves. And when anger is on the top of the surface and it hurts so deep, it might be time. First of all, we can't make a proper relationship. And maybe it might be time this Rosh Hashanah to reconnect in a way of, of just unloading and just telling Hashem, look at how much I've gone through. And I felt so alone. I hope that this year you'll be there for me in a way that I should be able to see it and to feel it in a tangible way and reconnect to you in a tangible way. And, and if you want me to go through, then please give me the strength to persevere and let me see you in all darkness. Maybe it's time to unload sometimes. It's actually, it, there is actually a mitzvah that if one wants to really ha make a relationship, the first thing in a relationship is to confront the other person if they've been pained by them. This is the only way, that's the, the layer that seals sometimes and like a barrier and does not let the relationship happen. And sometimes you have to peel away that layer first, that layer of anger, in order to be able to let that rela relationship resonate and feel itself. So Rosh Hashanah is about meeting up and reviving the relationship. Yom Kippur is a time already of making up. It's a time that we started the relationship and, and it's the day where Hashem says, you know, Let's let go of the old. I forgive. And fasting is our reciprocal of Hashem's forgiveness in the relationship. Sukkot is already a time that we're celebrating the future vision of living a life of togetherness and redemption. It's a time where we let ourselves fall into the embrace of Hashem with love. Now, I want to, I want to just say a note to those that have gone through such hard moments in their lives this past year, and even the years before, whenever that was, that the only thing that they most wanted in their lives was to die. And they survived. So I know that when I was young, I learned that there's a phenomenon called Kiddush Hashem, meaning that if someone dies just for the sake of being Jewish, is killed just because he was Jewish, 
whether he offered his life rather, uh, rather than converting or whether he was just killed because of being Jewish and for nothing else, then it is said that all gates of heaven open for him and he doesn't have to stand in front of the heavenly court and, and he's just able to reach to a point of such eternal bliss and connection uh, for eternity. And it was told, you know, as much as I learned, was told to be optimally amazing for those that have chosen and they overcome those mo overcame those moments whether consciously or even subconsciously of wanting to die and they chose to stay alive and they made it through to stay alive every moment of life from then and forever as long as they live is literally a moment of kiddush hashem these are so, not just one moment of giving away your life, but giving away death for the sake of life because that's what Hashem wants for us and because we believe, or even if we don't believe, that someday there's going to be light and someday we're going to be able to do something good is so much Kiddush Hashem and it's Kiddush Hashem forever, even when the pain is gone. Every moment of life is an eternal moment of Kiddush Hashem and we're gonna be able to, and you are gonna be able to reap the rewards for this one day. And I wanna give you a special blessing that may you merit to see in this coming year so many moments of, m many moments of um, being able to say that this is the moment that was worth surviving for. And, for others that are now in a very dark place and yearning for light and seeing themselves in a very, very long and hard tunnel, I want to tell you there is light at the end of the tunnel. Nobody stays in pain forever. There are lights somewhere here and there in our lives and hopefully there should be a big and beautiful light for you. Really, really, really Bakarov. And I also want to give you my, my wish that even if you're still in the tunnel and things don't seem so bright, that you should, be, you should see so many moments in this coming year that there should be light even in the tunnel until, until you come through. And for all of us, may we merit to hear the music of the show for this year with joy as we prepare to reconnect and fall into the embrace of Hashem with renewed love. Okay. Questions, anyone? Very different. Um, okay, so here's the question. But if we don't currently believe, how would we feel there's a good payback for life? What do we do if we don't currently believe right now? Um, so, first of all, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, there is a reason for not currently believing. And usually the reason is because we don't see light. It's extremely hard to believe when there's no light. And the longer the tunnel, and the longer that there's no light, and that we don't feel any loving connection, it's even harder to believe. And it do, it's not, even, not just harder to believe because the tunnel or the dark is so long, but it ends up being that, that the message that there is nobody there to respond really gets reinforced the longer the time that we're going through hardships. Um, there is, there is a, certain, a certain window that, you know, that we were, were able to tolerate as, as hardships in life. But, and then there's a certain window that we need for freedom to think and to let our cognitive brains, you know, see things in a positive way, have clarity, but when that when window of, of hardships fills up and it ends up overflowing into the window of freedom to think and, and ease in thinking, then we get so over, um, overloaded. Our thinking brain gets so overloaded that there's no way we can even fathom or picture the light. And when we don't see any light, it's, it's just very hard to believe. I would say if there is any way, I don't know who I'm speaking to, but if there is any way that you could get help at least for someone to hold your hand or be there with you or be on your side and validate you while you're going through or until you're able to overcome whatever is hardships in life, in life that you should be able to think free and to feel eased. 
that's going to help you maybe see the light. And also, um, I would say that when it's hard to believe, then I would say maybe it's time to just pour your anger in, in a way of just speaking to God. And if it's very hard to think that there is a God, it's even easier for you, not for God's sake, for your sake, to just put a chair across you and just pour the anger out and saying, God, I'm imagining, envisioning that you are maybe here and you're sitting on this chair. I just want to tell you how angry I am. And whatever it is, pour out your anger. You can do it as much as you want and as many days as you want. Maybe, maybe you'll get a little bit of freedom inside of you to be able to breathe and to be able to, to and in a, in, in after that, after a while, if you might be able to have help to overcome whatever is, it is in your life that has been hard on you, you might be able to feel a little bit of freedom and try to connect again. I mean, try to just, I, I know that, I just know that it's so, so hard to talk and it's so hard to talk to God when we're so fed up and so full of anger and we hadn't been answered so many times and it was like knocking at the door over and over again and nobody was there. That's how it feels. So if you want to listen and maybe I would, you know, I would uh, say this as a general message. There is, there is a certain, so pain is a thing that we can't really understand, especially we keep on saying that there is a God and he's running the world with love and kindness. Where's the love and kindness when there is so much pain? Um, I can't really answer all the answers of pain and we can't really answer why so many generations have been suffering in all the years and why it seemed like certain thrillers were sent up day and night and were never answered. I can only say a parable that, that I understood and gave me a certain vision of relief and of ease and, and comfort and I'll say later why. So when the 10 great Tanoim or great sages were killed, and they were really great sages. They were killed in very brutal ways. The angels asked God, is this Torah? And is, is this what you're paying for Torah? They said, so Torah, is this Torah? And is this the Sechar? And God answered, if you won't be quiet, then I'll bring the, the, the world back to its original state, in, into water. I'll, I'll destroy the world and bring it back to water in its original state. So most com many commentaries asked, wait, wait, God really didn't have an answer? He had to just, he had to just say, oh, you know what, I'll, I'll bring the world back to zero if you're not going to be quiet. So that means that God really didn't have an answer. So commentaries are very, um, like, puzzled by this. So Vilna Gaon said that he's going to explain it in a way that it resonated to me. He said that the king wanted to have a very expensive garment and went to get a very expensive fabric and gave it to his tailor and his tailor made a phenomenal job. And the bishop was very jealous and said, King, his majesty, this doesn't measure up. If you measure the fabric, you're going to see that you're running short. And probably the tailor took a piece of fabric and is making a garment on his own with this very expensive fabric, the same as the king. And the king said, I don't believe it. And then he said, you know, why won't you measure it up? And they measured, and of course it fell short. So they were going to hang the tailor. And right before they were going to give him his death sentence, the king said, granted, what's your last wish? And he said, the king's new, um, the king's new cloak and a scissors. And so the king brought his garment and scissors and, and was shocked to see that the uh, tailor wants to cut it up. And he started yelling, what are you doing? So he said, in order for the king to understand that every piece of fabric was used, I need to undo the whole thing, cut it up into pieces and show you, put it back together like a puzzle to show you that it all fit. And I haven't used a tiny bit of this fabric for myself and it matches up. And so in the same way, God told for the angels, I created this world from beginning of the world to the end of the world as one garment or as one puzzle. Every piece in history and in the future fits. Some pieces are very painful and we don't know why we're going through so much pain. But there is an answer. And the comfort that I take out of this is that God understands more than I do. Because if someone has the intellect of me, human intellect, I would not trust him. My life is too precious, too complex, too hard, too valuable, and my family and everyone, that I should trust it in, in, in someone's uh, hands that doesn't have more understanding than a human being. And because he sees a full picture from beginning to end that I don't understand, that's the reason why I trust him. 
So yeah, we cannot see God and we don't always see him answering. Sometimes all we get is pain and it takes a long time until we see the light. But at least I know that God knows better than me. So I'm sorry if it's really, really hard for you to see the light. And I do want to give you a wish that you should be able to see the light and really, really have a happy and joyous life. Thank you so much. More, more questions came, uh, come, it came in late. If I can uh, keep, uh, keep giving yeah, them over yeah, to you. Yeah, I can keep going and I can maybe try to make them shorter. Okay, no problem. That's, that's excellent. Um, your mic is a little different than it was um, at the beginning. I'm not sure if there's any way to adjust the phone or maybe the internet, um, but I'm going to say the next question. Okay, so the next question says, I have an issue with the concept of Rosh Hashanah being all about the joy. First of all, what do we do with the judgment part? It seems like a half of a deal to only focus on the joy of crowning God. Are we ignoring the assessment? Is that just my abusive childhood programming talking? The same fear instilled theme? Definitely all fear, because I think that Vilna Gaon was, was enough of, a, of a, an understanding person um, that understood more than the people in today's generation and more than many, many people. And he said, definitely, um, it is a joyous day. A chauffeur should be going with joy. It is a day of reassessment, and it's like the king come in, comes into his, whatever it is, his, his government, his, and, and he looks at the people, and he says, you know, are you planning to revolt, or are you planning to take upon government rules? For the ones that are planning to take upon government rules, meaning, you know what, let me let you lead my life, and I'll try to do the best I can at every given moment, and I still... I still, you know, I, I, I cherish that connection and I'm here. Well, the king is going to say, let's go. We're in. And for the ones that are just on Rosh Hashanah saying, this is just not for me. Um, you know, it's not that, so God has a very long anger span. It's not that God is going to say, you know, that, that means that you deserve that. Because he doesn't really do that. And we say, but then he can wait so many years for us to decide if we want to turn just like that friend that's following us. There is a judgment element in Rosh Hashanah. It is the day of, it's called Yom Hadin. Why is it called Yom Hadin, the day of judgment? Because it's a day of assessment. It's the birthday of the world. And God comes again to his world and says, what did I create this world for? Let's see. The whole world is supposed to synchronize in nature. People are supposed to respect nature. Nature to respect the people we're all supposed to work as one unit as one symphony and sing the song of the world together and be kind to each other be nice be understanding be loving um connecting to god everyone in, in their way whatever they have the ability for so it is a day of judgment but if we're there and we're ready and we're ready with joy and saying oh god i'm happy for this connection and i'm gonna try this again then there should be no fear that should run the day. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, if I'm still bad, how shouldn't I fear, especially after such a year? That's an amazing question. It's really an amazing question. When Adam ate from the tree uh, of knowledge in, in, in Gan Eden, he and his wife hid, and they became very complex. And um, God asked them, where are you? Why did he ask them, where are you? God was waiting for Adam to come forth and say, I'm sorry. And I'm willing to maximize my potential further on. And his hiding and trying to run away and feeling inferior and feeling that he is already less than and not worthy is what put him to the, into the place of having to come down a struggle. So you're not bad. Whatever you did this year, you erred. You had a hard time. If you can just not see yourself as a bad person and see yourself as a potentially potentially wonderful person with a brand new opportunity of starting the year in your own way to the best of your ability, then you're just not bad. And it's really important not to judge yourself and to see yourself in a positive light. And God will also see you see you in a positive light because there is so much positive in you. I wish we could all see how much light there is in us. As a matter of fact, after the, the destroying of the of the temple, for seven weeks until Rosh Hashanah, from from Tisha B'Av until Rosh Hashanah, for seven weeks, Hashem kept on giving words of condolence for the Jews and for Yerushalayim to tell them that there's going to come a time and we're going to rejoice and, and join again. And I think it was in the second week of the Haftorah, Hashem said to Yerushalayim, he spoke to, and he said, Sian, be happy, you childless uh, woman, because the children of 
poverty and were sent away, be happy you ch- you're going to have children again, or you're going to be able to see you have children. And right away, the second verse is um, expand your boundaries for the light that's coming. So what's the light that, the light that is coming? The light is every Jew that's going to return to, to Yerushalayim when Mashiach comes. There's going to be so much light emanating from every Jew. We don't see our light. And no matter how much we mess up, there's a part of us that stays untainted. There's an amazing light that can break everything through. And whatever it is that we see ourselves bad is only layers and shells upon that light. But if we can shed those layers and say, this is not me, I am essentially good, and let those layers fall and see yourself in your light at least a little bit, God sees you in the brightest light that you cannot even imagine. To the point that God is saying already to Zion, expand your boundaries because you need to have a place for all this light of the people coming. And it doesn't say that God is only going to redeem the ones that believe they're good or that think or that, that were perfect. What does it say every morning when we dive in? It says, Bona your shalayim Hashem. Hashem is going to build your shalayim. How? Nitche Yisrael Yechanais. The outcast of Am Yisrael, he's going to gather in. He's going to heal their broken hearts and bind their sorrows. Why? There are about 30 billion stars to each person. I don't know if I have the number right, but there are so many stars in the world. There's, it's impossible to count them. God has a count of every single star. And then it says that he has a name for each star. So for sure, he knows every one of his children through and through, understands and sees your hardships, understands and sees our pain, and understands our weaknesses when we fall through. The minute we say, God, this is not me. I am not bad. I'm ready to forge this relationship again. We're okay. Very nice. Thank you so much. Um, so first, the first one is, how do I not fear after having things so bad? And the next one is about guilt. Um, it seems like the good year is promised to those who repent and return. If we're not up for doing that, why would I connect to Rosh Hashanah um, without just feeling guilty? So that, that question about the guilt is, um, is imposed guilt. There's no truth to that, that we're not worthy of having a good year when we want to start again. The, the, it's, it's again, it's seeing ourselves in a negative light for many reasons. The first reason is because our parents that we so trusted all the years and were so dependent and attached to them and needed that attachment and our teachers that we looked up to as our, um, you know, they were supposed to show us the way and teach us uh, lessons of life, were imposing more fear than necessary and imposing more guilt than necessary. God has no problem holding us even if we err a thousand times. And a human being, when they see another person err, they have a very big problem holding them, accepting them, even after one time erring. So it's a people-imposed fear, and it's also a people-imposed guilt. And also, we learn to see ourselves in the light of how our parents and friends see us, and also teachers see us. So if our parents and friends and teachers tell us that we're bad people for doing certain things, then we learn to see ourselves as bad people. And that's not fair because God does not see us that way. Okay, so the original question was, what if I don't currently uh, believe? Now this second question is a little bit different here. Um, what if I feel like I don't have a relationship with God? How is there any meaning in Rosh Hashanah? If it's based on love and a relationship of us to God and I have no relationship, what's left? That's a great question. So... Again, as I said before, it's very, very hard to connect if you've gone through and you feel that you've gone so far that there's no relationship behind you anymore. So as I said before, God follows you through and he, he actually feels your pain and he is there and, and and he's not an angry God and he's there for you and ready that if you do want to try and say, you know what, you know, let me give this a try and I will... I'll, I'll accept you as king again. There's always a chance to start anew. Now, I wouldn't say that it's easy to take upon anything when you can't concentrate or you can't, as I said before, that if a person is 
overfilled with hardships and pain and hasn't worked through their issues in life that are so, so pressing on them, I would recommend if you can find a friend, a therapist, someone to hold you through your pain and help you alleviate some of it, that you should be able even to focus and to function. Because the Torah actually is very flexible, although it's the same rules and the same laws all along. But if you ask someone that's skilled, if you're connected to someone that really understands not just halacha, but really understands um, emotional pain or hardships and also halacha, they're going to know to tell you that you're only supposed to do certain things if you feel you can do it. If you really feel that you're not emotionally up to it, you don't have to. So I'm not the rabbi to say what you could, what you should. And it's not really a good idea to connect to any random rabbi to ask questions of what do you think I can take upon myself if I am having hardships with this and this? Is there anything I should take upon myself? So when I had a certain hardship in my life, I went to my rabbi and asked, what do you think I should take upon myself? And the rabbi told me nothing. Just, just take care of yourself. And when you have a chance and an ability to talk to God, talk to God, even in your own words, nothing. So what I want to say is that if we can ease ourselves, first of all, if we can ease and take care of whatever it is that's hurting us and, and have someone that should be there to listen to us and handhold through, then automatically there's going to be an easier capacity to say, you know what, I'm in this relationship, even if you don't do anything. Um, so uh, going back to, um, I lost my train of thoughts. Um, about the person that doesn't that that feels like um, the the relationship with God is over. She believes in God, but like it, there doesn't seem like there's a relationship yeah, left. So actually, how- there's nothing. There's, there's nothing really that feels like it's over. That 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 says that it's over. As we say in Yom Kippur, that uh, I don't desire the dying of the dead, and that connotes the dead relationship. So, and 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 God is there to always mute says v'chaya and I'll view life. The second you're ready for it, you feel that you're able to and you want to connect just even in talking to God, it ends up being, uh, he, he's always there. He's always there to embrace you. Beautiful. Another one. This is about family. How do I deal with family members of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur Sukkot and listening to the talk of, we could still do tshuva, tshuva, tshuva. Or my kids coming home from school will talk about the safer of Sadiq and Rashaim. Or if we do tshuva, corona will go away. Is it healthy to encourage kids by telling them about all the great they do and are? and that their safer Hatzadikim is surely what they are? How do we balance this classic scale? Um, so this is a misconception of tshuva. Tshuva doesn't mean to, to, to throw everything against yourself of what you were maybe doing or, or what you maybe did or that you're a negative or bad person or tshuva is not about crying all the time. Tshuva is, is tashuv, the word tshuva is made out of tashuv and the letter he. It's returning to your higher self, meaning connecting to the best of yourself. It's returning to God in a loving way. That's what tshuva means. Meaning, you know what? There's more opportunity now to talk to God. I'm just, I just have more to say. Now I can daven for Corona. Let's just send a little, a little tefillah and to do it happily. And you know what? Maybe we should... We should just thank God every day with one little thing that went good today. How was school? How was like to sit down at a supper table and tell kids, let's connect to God in a beautiful way. How about, did you have a friend today? Did you have something good for lunch? How was, you know, how did you feel? How, that's tshuva. That's connecting to God in a beautiful, positive way. To say that this and this is coming because of, Corona is coming because of this, because of that. To blame it on things and to say it is up to us and we can remove corona from the world. No, it doesn't work this way. We don't really control why things are happening. All we could control is to make the world a better place from as much as we can do. And then we can connect to God in a way of asking him, let me feel your embrace and let me feel the connection. I love that. Amen. All right. Someone just asked, as Rosh Hashanah mentions in the Torah, I think it's mentioned as Yom HaTrua. Is, it is mentioned. I'm not yeah. sure of all the details. Okay. Um, a longer question. If I struggle with my Yiddishkeit laws, faith and all, and I truly don't know if I can commit to do any better this upcoming year, how do I show up to Rosh Hashanah to feel happy and excited? 
I sort of feel like I'm uninvited to the celebration. It's like dancing at a wedding of someone I wronged. What am I happy for? Wow, that's very, very well expressed. Very articulate, very well expressed. Thank you. Yeah, so can you read, can you reread the beginning of the sentence? Yeah, yeah sure. I, I, we have the deepest members. They're really incredible. Um, they incredible. said, if I, if I struggle with my Yiddishkeit, the laws, faith, and all, and I truly don't know if I can commit to do any better for this upcoming year, how do I show up to Rosh Hashanah and feeling happy and excited? I feel like I'm uninvited to a celebration. I'm dancing at a wedding for someone that I wronged. Um, so first of all, doing better doesn't exactly mean doing better the things that you thought you should have done the way you should have done it in the past. There, there are many ways, there are many ways of learning Torah. There are beautiful and joyous ways of learning. And there are also very fearful, fear imposed ways of learning by people that are extremely fearful of doing anything wrong or teaching anything wrong or that anyone else around them is going to do anything wrong. Fear, Fear-based Judaism is not exactly what Judaism is meant to be. Judaism is meant to be joyous. And the Torah is like a song. It's like a blueprint to the world and to nature. Nature is supposed to be beautiful. The world is supposed to be a joyous place. And the human being is supposed to be the conductor of nature. And it's, it's, like, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a real symphony of, let, of say, 50, 50 people playing instruments. And the conductor has to conduct in, 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 in a way that everything should, should synchronize. So by us learning Torah, what we're doing is, we're, since the Torah is the blueprint of the world, is like we're, we're putting on the symphony into song. Everything goes into song when we connect to learning Torah. Now, learning Torah does not exactly mean learning what you're supposed to do or not supposed to do all the time in conforming without, without even understanding what, when, why, and what's behind it, and even enjoying it. There are so many joyous ways of learning. I actually myself sought out a rabbi that is very non-judgmental. He's an amazing person. And his way of learning is inviting everyone into the learning to ask their questions and being able to bring pieces from all sides and to see how things form like one beautiful tapestry from, I'd say, 10 parches at a time from 10 different places. And it's, it's incredible that I haven't known in all of my past that learning can really be so joyous. Maybe, just maybe, you've been learning in a very pressuring way or in a very fearful way. Maybe you could take upon finding a certain speaker or rabbi that learns in a way that resonates within you with joy. To take upon learning with joy is the most beautiful thing you can do, do for the world. If you feel like whatever you're going to take upon this coming year, you can't even take upon yourself because it's being so strenuous, then one of the two pieces are missing. Either you're physically or emotionally stressed and you need a lot of self-care in order to, to be able to come to a place of even being able to concentrate on learning. So that's the first piece. Self-care is the first piece. Second piece is to find a way of learning with more joy, not in a strenuous way. It is impossible for us to walk around with such a heavy burden on our shoulders when it doesn't make sense, it doesn't resonate. It's scary. It makes me feel guilty all the time. Torah is not meant to make you feel guilty. So maybe if you want to seek out a good rabbi or something, or if you feel that's first time to just take care of yourself and say, you know what, I'll be learning in a year from now, that's okay. You, just, you, can't, you can't expect yourself to do things and to serve God in a complex way when yourself is not ready. You have to be ready first. I mean, physically, emotionally, you have to be ready first. Beautiful. And I guess I want to add here also that um, I think part of what people here can keep in mind is that if you're not ready to make Jewish changes, that getting healthier, that, that taking care of yourself and becoming a healthier person and loving yourself a little more, that in itself is a form of tshuva, that in itself is a form of return. And it may not look like the mitzvahs that you learned in school or that seem so Jewish, but um, essentially healing yourself as a human being is the beginning of where the rest of it comes. So if you can make any progress, even in becoming healthier um, or you know, um, 
caring for yourself more this year. That's, that's another way. Um, that's something else that you can celebrate that maybe you'll commit for Rosh Hashanah that this year you'll, you know, find a way to, um, to, to heal a little bit more. Um, okay, some more yes, questions. Yes, by the way, yes, by the way, doesn't mean only, you know what, this year I'm going to heal, and I promise next year I'm just going to start taking on, uh, on things. No, I'm going to be healing as long as it takes for me to be able to reconnect. If you're healing for the purpose of becoming a stronger and better person and reaching the best of your potential to contribute to this world in a positive way, then that's taking upon yourself all oh, time. That's taking upon, that's, that's the relationship. And that's the part that you can contribute right now. The part is called healing. And that's amazing. So this may be a, um, a little bit repetitive, but um, I'll read a couple more like this. So this person's wondering, is this Rosh Hashanah is more like a day of God judging himself? Like why was the world created and how it's doing? Or is it indeed judging the people's actions too? Is he assessing, did I do a good job in creating the world? Or are we actually being judged? I think Rosh Hashanah is not, I mean, I, don't, I can't say I think, it's, it's what, what my Rebbe taught me, that it's something about going ahead. It's not, it's, it's, it's more like judging to see, like, what are we doing ahead of time from now on? Where is this world going to take me? Is it worthwhile that this world, world should be um, reinstated, put back into place. I should take this kingship forward. What am I going to do for the world? What's the world going to mean for me in, in this coming year? It's a reassessment of how are we going forward? I don't think it's God judging himself if it was worth it to create the world. And I don't think it's so much about God judging. Is it worth it to still keep these people because of their past? It's rather judging of how do we go forward? Who wants to come along in the future? What are we doing from here on? I'm going to skip ahead to um, other people's questions because some of these people ask more than one. Why do we have to go back to Hashem if he's the one who caused this pain? Also, of course, he sees our pain. He's the one that caused it. Why are we making God out to be so innocent? I talk to God. He doesn't respond. Why would we want to be in such a one-sided relationship? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I, I really hear in your question a lot, a lot of pain. You must have been going through the ringer a lot. Yeah, it's it's a painful world, and and so for, to some, to some, it's a very painful world. And I can really say, as I said before, I I don't see the whole picture. It's just like that one big garment, or or there is this this thing called needlepoint. I have one in my dining room where you sew stitch by stitch of a picture with embroidery thread, and every time you change the thread, you have to make a knot on the bottom. And on the bottom, it looks really, really ugly. This world, to us, we only see the bottom. We don't see a picture. And it's being sewn ever so slowly from when the world was created until the end. All we see is a jumble of knots. All we see is pain. We don't, we don't get to see all this. We know that when Mashiach will come at the time of redemption, we will see the tapestry turn over. The, to the right side and we will see the whole picture and the picture is going to be a beautiful, a beautiful picture guess what happens when one of the stitches in this embroidery thing is missing there's a hole there is no hole in the whole format and creation of the world some of the stitches look really horrible and messy and they really are painful from the bottom and that's all we see so since I don't see the whole picture there's really no way I can answer pain and I, I wish I can give you an answer for all this. It's extremely hard to believe that God is there when we don't hear an answer. Really, really extremely hard. All I can say is I'm sorry for your pain. And I would really recommend if you can have help just getting you through this. And then one final question here. Um, how can I be happy after I saw last week's partial what God will do to us if we don't listen to him? Okay, that's, that's an amazing question. And I, and I listened to a one-hour lecture from my rabbi for this, and it's just going to take so long to explain. Just, just in, in very short, it's, it's, it's just a, wow, this is a deep, beautiful question. So last week, by the way, there were two parshas. One was Nitzavim, which is all the scary things uh, that it says that could happen if there's, you know, if, if we don't behave or whatever it is. 
And the next one was Vayelech. And Vayelech was, was Moshe, ben, Moshe leaving this world. And before he left the world, he went to every person's, every person's tent, knocked into every person's tent, and he bid farewell for every person. Um, so going back in time, when God instructed Moses to tell the Jews about the teachings of the Torah, he told, them to, he told him to talk to everyone in their own language. Some, some people could only hear very explicit things. Some people could only hear, um, uh, you know, in a very sharp way, they need that author, authoritative uh, kind of teaching. And some people can only hear very soft words and some people. So God told Moses to talk to each person in their own way. And Moses came down and just ordered the whole court, uh, you know, the, the whole Sanhedrin and everything. And, and he just told them what God said in the Torah and told them to teach it and to, and to convey the messages. And, and what happened to that uh, piece that God told him to talk to everyone in their own language? He did that by Parshas Vayelach last week. He went to every person's tent and told them, Vayelach means going forward, told them how to use the Torah going forward. So Nitzavim was the Pasha where the Jews were petrified that Moses is leaving them. They were very, very scared and they were planning and thinking on what are they going to do? Who are they going to take to guide them? And, what, and they were going into a lot of fear. What fear brings, fear brings confusion. Fear brings loss of concentration. Fear brings loss of clarity, just like by the eagle. The fear brought them to create the eagle, although maybe 40 days before, they saw God and God opened up all the worlds and skies and they saw through and saw that God is really the one running the world and created everything. And he was the one that took them out of Mitzrayim and did all the things for them. And then 40 days later, out of panic, they created the golden calf and betrayed God. So in Nitzavim, they were so petrified that Moses is leaving them. And that is where they got the order that if you fall back on the sphere, you're going to fall into a trap of fear, trouble, and everything. And the way it is, you can read that Pasha in two ways. You could read it in a past way of falling back into trouble, but then you can also read in a way of going forward, and then that way, it's in a positive way. There's two ways of reading the Pasha. And Vayelik, the one that follows, is to tell the Jews, go forward, move forward. This is exactly this question that you just asked. I wasn't going to go into the longer explanation. And by the way, I can't explain it very thoroughly now because it's going to take me an hour. But what you just asked is exactly the answer to the question that another member asked before. If God is, is um, judging the world for the past and evaluating if it was worth him for, to, for him to create the world, to sustain the world and and worth for the people to continue living according to their past actions. God doesn't judge this way. In Natsavim, God says that if you fall back into fear, you fall into a trap. And Vayelech is the Pasha that says, go forward. We're always moving forward. If Adam would say, you know what? I'm sorry, God. I messed up. I'm ready to be the best of myself. He would have still stayed in Ganeidi. And in the same way, if we stay stuck in our past and in our fear, then we stay entrapped and we can go forward. So we have to focus on not getting stuck into fear, but rather always going vayelach, going forward, going into positivity, going into brightness, going into hope, going into giving and spreading light and expanding. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, do you have time for one more question or do you need to get going or have... Okay, let me hear one more question. Okay. How do we trust that Moshe gave it over, not rephrase or even altogether that God sent this and this is how he sent it? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't hear. What did he say? Yeah, yeah. So it's a question about, like, uh, about belief in the Torah. How do we trust that Moshe gave it over, not rephrased or even altogether that God sent this and this is how he sent it? How do we basically essentially trust that, um, that this Torah is from God? This is the person, the same question, this person said that he's not sure if he believes in God at the beginning, and now he's saying, and he's not sure. How do we know that um, that the Torah is from God, or that we got it in the right order, or you know, in its entirety? Yeah, that's that's actually a great question. So um, this is one of the questions that um, 
that are also phrased in very many different ways. One of the ways is that if I would grow in, uh, up in a, in a Christian home and I would be taught the Christian religion all my life, then I would just as well believe that. Or if I would grow in a Buddhist home, and why is this any different? Um, so it all basically boils down to the same thing. This is the only religion that is given over in a very different and exclusive way. And the way it's given over is all about you. The Torah is written in a way of, of, of God talking to the Jewish people in the form, a lot, a lot, in the form of you. So Moses is telling the Jews, retelling the Jews the story that happened to them. You were in Mitzrayim. I took you out of there. I did the makas for you. I took you as a nation, and here you are today at Har Sinai. I gave your parents. I made a bond with your, your grandfather. It was all about talking to the Jews about themselves. And no one said, it's not true. The story stayed the same way. And they were all, they, and the way they even gave it over to their children and grandchildren was in the same way that Moses spoke it out of the Torah. Meaning he told them everything that they've gone through and that they've, and that they've achieved and that they've gotten from God. And they also repeated the story as a beautiful life story to their children in the exact same way that Moses and that God gave it over in the Torah to them. So you can always distort stories or make up stories saying, God came to me in my sleep and he said to me that I have to be the redeemer and I have to, and you know what? Uh, I've done that already 20 years ago. And when I told them all about God, they all died. And you are now alive, and God did this to me again, and he told me that I have to be your redeemer. So it's up to the people if they want to believe the story or they don't want to believe the story. But when you tell the people, you were in Egypt, you had this happening, I did this to you, you tell them their story, there is no, you can't tell to a person a story what happened to them if it didn't happen. So this is the only religion where everything is given over in a form of God talking to the Jews and telling them about their story and they have given it over to the children as their story, actually. So we don't live by possibility. We live by probability. And I mean, if you think of a probable way, probably you can't tell for about 10 million people a story of what they've gone through when it's not true. They're not going to buy it. Hey, Galea, thank you so much for your time. Um, lots of positive messages here, private messaging me um, for thanking you for your time and your wisdom and your love. Um, and uh, we wish you uh, and your family a good kabench yar. And uh, Hashem yeah. should give you a uh, continued um, you know, strength to, uh, to continue inspiring um, so many people. Amen. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. And I wish you an easy and happy Beautiful, prosperous year. Thank you Amen. all. Okay, thank you. Good night. Good night.